Good afternoon. My name is Kim, and I'm with Breathe New Hampshire. And uh, through Tessa and some other folks, we were invited to share our Vaping Unveiled content. And um, Sarah, if you're still on mute, you, do you want to just introduce yourself as well? Sure, yep. Uh, my name's Sarah. I'm also with Breathe New Hampshire. Um, I started a couple weeks ago, actually, um, right before this whole remote learn, uh, work environment started. So um, I'm just accompanying Kim to help her out in any way I can, um, and obviously I learn as much as I can as well. Um, but I am the new program coordinator here, um, and I'm happy to be here. So please, if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, type it up in the chat, and I can uh, bring that to Kim's attention so she can address the questions as we go along. Sure. Thank you. So um, our program, Vaping Unveiled, is a result of the work that our nonprofit does. Breed New Hampshire is a public health nonprofit organization located in Manchester, but we do stuff statewide. Uh, the focus of our organization is lung health and issues and concerns related to lung health. So one of the focus programs for us the last couple of years has been uh, youth and the impact of vaping to youth, some of the health concerns, some of the knowns and some of the unknowns. Um, some of the other things that we do around the state are programs related to asthma, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We work on some clean air policies. Um, again, this presentation is a big one right now. Uh, we also do some policy work, meaning active legislation and advocacy. I'm uh, one of the people in our group that works on policy as well as programs. Um, so there's a lot of different pieces. Um, and we, again, we are a nonprofit. So a lot of our revenue is from fundraising and individual donations. And sometimes we're fortunate to get additional funding uh, for projects like Vaping Unveiled, and these are two of the funders for this particular project. So one thing we can do is offer this at no cost to schools and other nonprofit organizations and coalitions at this point. So overall, um, what is vaping? What do we know about it? So vaping is inhaling and exhaling different aerosols that are produced by e-cigarette or similar devices that are battery powered or rechargeable. Um, the combination of things in these, it's turning nicotine flavorings and other chemicals into an aerosol. It's not a water vapor, it, it is an aerosol, which we'll explain a little bit more. Um, and the variety of names and device types has changed dramatically over time. Uh, some things that all of these have in common is that the products themselves are not safe for kids, for teens, for young adults, or for pregnant women. And we'll explain more as we go through some of the health impacts. The devices all have a few things in common, no matter their shape or size. Uh, they have a power source. A lot of the newer devices, it's a battery power source. It could be a rechargeable or disposable device. They have something called an atomizer, which is a heating coil. That's what the liquids travel over. That's what heats them up and creates an aerosol. E-liquids for refillable devices can come in pre-filled bottles uh, that people purchase, or you hear about devices that have pods or cartridges that are already loaded with a, an e-liquid. Again, all of these products produce an aerosol. Uh, devices, again, have changed dramatically over time. Um, you can see that when they first started and came onto the market in the U.S. in 2007, they looked like a traditional cigarette. So the target market was people trying to quit smoking. That's who they were marketed to initially. Um, there were no flavors involved. It was nicotine cartridges. You would gradually reduce the amount of nicotine that the person used in the cartridge, hoping to get them off nicotine altogether. Uh, the image on the far left went for like $135 and up. It came in a gift box, and that's all it looked like. There were no other different device types. A few years later, you have the center image, which are tank or modular systems. Um, bigger, bulkier, this is when flavors were introduced. And the reason they're called mods is you can modify the system. You could change the battery. You could change the mouthpiece. You could change the metal that it was made out of. Then more recently in 2020, we're hearing and seeing a lot of disposable devices. 
Um, these are pre-filled with a flavor, they're pre-charged, and then you get rid of them after two or 300 hits of nicotine. So they're ending up in landfill. Um, again, something to keep in mind is most vape devices and products contain nicotine. We do know from studies of cigarettes and other tobacco products that nicotine is highly addictive. Um, the other concern is the flavors in these products. They're from chemicals. Some of these chemicals, the people will market them and say these chemicals are what's used in food. Well, they are, yes, in some cases, safe flavors to have in food items, but they're not necessarily safe to mix with other chemicals, heat up at a variety of temperatures, and inhale. They haven't been tested that way, so nobody knows the long-term health impacts. Again, the concern with the aerosol is that over time, you have to keep in mind that the e-liquids, the pre-filled cartridges, when you look at them, it's a very heavy oil-based chemical and substance that you're starting with. So you're heating something up, creating an aerosol. It has a stickiness to it. Depending on the size of the device, there is more or less aerosol inhaled by the user and exhaled. Um, in some cases, if somebody vapes in their car a lot and is using a larger device, you may actually see kind of a cloudiness on the car windshield. It builds up over time, sim similar to when somebody smokes in the car a lot, you see a film on the windshield. Um, the other concern with this aerosol is similar to secondhand smoke. Secondhand aerosol can impact people that are not doing the vaping, uh, people who have lung conditions already like asthma or COPD, if they're in a confined space with somebody vaping, it could trigger an asthma attack in someone. So again, something to keep in mind. The other thing with the aerosol is potentially there are fine metal particles in the aerosol. Uh, this is the result of these liquids traveling over that heating coil. And in some cases over time, the finish wears off the heating coil. So these fine metal particles end up in the liquid that's heated up and created in an aerosol and then the person's potentially inhaling it. Um, again, the industry is not fully regulated. We keep hearing about new regulations passed. Uh, something to keep in mind is back as far as 2016, all of these devices and liquids were classified and are classified as tobacco products. So the same rules and regulations apply to vape devices as do to tobacco products. Um, the thing that is not fully regulated is the thousands of flavors that are out there and the hundreds of device types. Again, everybody's going to be different as to how much they use a device or a pod or a um, cartridge. Each person inhales differently, so it's very hard to predict the impact to, pe to people in general because each person and each device is so different. Among the concerns for young people are we had gotten the use of traditional cigarette products um, down to single digits across the country and even here in New Hampshire over time. It took many years of um, education and awareness to reduce youth tobacco use as far as cigarettes and cigars and other products. Um, unfortunately, with the introduction of vape devices, we've seen a huge increase in youth use of these products across the country bringing it back up to double digits, almost to 28% for high school students, 10.5% for middle school students. Um, here in New Hampshire, I don't know what Conway schools do. Um, not all schools participate in the New Hampshire Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, but the results from 2019 are out, and we've seen a 10% increase in youth use rates in New Hampshire. Uh, this means that on the survey question, they answered yes to the question, have you vaped at least one time in the last 30 days prior to taking the survey? So from 2017 to 2019, there was a 10% increase in youth use rates in New Hampshire. Um, so that's a concern. It's also a concern because we have one of the highest youth, youth, youth rates um, in the US, not just in New England, but across the United States, we have one of the highest youth use rates. Uh, something else to keep in mind with these variety of devices um, about nicotine, and again we know this from 50 years of studies of cigarettes, nicotine can be and is a powerful mood altering substance, it's highly addictive, um, it is found naturally in tobacco plants, in the leaves, 
Um, that is the cheapest way to process it. So the nicotine that's in a lot of these e-liquids and pods is the same nicotine that's used in cigarettes and other tobacco products. The, the question and the concern with young people is nicotine exposure can disrupt normal brain development. It can also alter the physical structure of the brain. And this is a concern because our brains continue to develop into our early to mid 20s. So that's why uh, from our point of view and from the public health perspective, there is a concern with exposure to products containing nicotine. How does it work on the brain? Well, different substances, for example, alcohol, cocaine, heroin, and nicotine all go after and directly affect the reward center of our brain. Um, this triggers a reaction in all of us, no matter what your age, but especially in young people with their brains still developing. In general and normally through a process normally, our reward center of our brain will release dopamine and adrenaline, which can make us feel good. When the reward center of the brain is triggered by use of other substances, those same chemicals can be released by the reward center of the brain. So you may actually feel good while you're using something that is not good for you. Um, years ago, it was found that inhaling from a cigarette because it's a combustible product, nicotine was delivered to the reward center of the brain in as little as seven seconds um, because it's such a quick and, and uh, powerful delivery system. That's why everybody reacts to nicotine, including young people. Um, with the vaping devices that are on the market right now, it takes anywhere from 10 to 20 seconds for the nicotine to hit the brain. Uh, we also need to keep in mind as far as the development of our brains, our brains develop from the back to the front. So the reward center, impulse control, learning, um, cognitive thinking, attention spans, those are all in the front part of the brain. So those parts of the brain are still developing and especially when you talk about impulse control, you can see why introducing substances at a young age may have a harmful effect. Uh, the other thing we like to, to make clear to young people and to adults is we just can't go out and buy a new brain. You can't go out and buy a new set of lungs. So the fewer things we introduce that are potentially harmful to our bodies at a young age, the better off we all are moving forward. Again, you know, keeping in mind attention and learning can, can be affected. It can also create bad wiring in your brain. In other words, it interrupts the brain circuits enough, so potentially your brain wiring mechanisms have changed if you introduce enough nicotine and use it over a long period of time. We know from years of studies of tobacco products prior to the vaping products uh, that nicotine has effects on the entire body. Um, when you smoke a cigarette, you're taking in nicotine into your lungs, it's distributed into your bloodstream and it goes throughout your body. Uh, some of the other potential harms from cigarettes and other tobacco products are things like heart disease, strokes, different forms of cancer, high blood pressure. We don't know the long-term health impacts of vape products. They haven't been on the market enough and we can't actually ask young kids to use products like this and then follow them in studies. So unfortunately, we may not know the long-term health impact for years to come. We have seen, however, some short-term health impacts, which we will discuss. Uh, other concerns, if young kids are in a household where people are vaping, um, you know, definitely there are people that can legally vape and use these products, but you need to be careful if there are young children in the household as well. Less than half a teaspoon of an e-liquid can be potentially fatal to a toddler if it's ingested. Um, why would they ingest it? Well, when you see some of the packaging, you can see why a young child might pick up uh, some of the e-liquids, the way they're packaged in these plastic bottles or glass bottles. You can also see how a young child may think it's intriguing to touch or pick up a device that they've seen an older person in their family use. Um, and again, even as adults, we're not necessarily good about reading warning labels. Well, a young child probably can't read the entire warning label or any of the warning label to know what's in the product. The other thing that's been happening um, in countries where vaping is allowed is occasionally there are animals that are 
accidentally poisoned. They're attracted to the sweet smells that some of these liquids give off. And a lot of these devices are pretty cheaply made. Sometimes they leak, so the pets lick up some of the e-liquids and can be harmed as well as people can. Some of the newer products out there use something called the nicotine salt formula. It's still a liquid. It's actually a more concentrated form of nicotine. You see those images on the left. Um, on the far right is what's called free-based nicotine, which is delivered in the way cigarettes deliver nicotine, where you're actually combusting the product and heating it up. Here in, um, with the newer salt concentrations and formulas, these packaged devices sometimes are preloaded with these formulas. And in some cases, they actually have more nicotine in them than cigarettes do. Um, that's a concern. The other concern is people that are first time users may have a, a negative reaction to smoking cigarettes because it delivers a harsher hit to the back of the throat when you first try them. Sometimes people cough when they first try cigarettes. This nicotine salt formula is actually a smoother delivery system. So people that are not as familiar with smoking may find it more acceptable. And then again, you add in some of the flavors that are out there. So for a long time, we kept hearing about uh, Juul. That at one point was a popular product among people of all ages. Well, one of the Juul pods, they come in three and 5% in the US. The 5% pod contains as much nicotine as a pack or more of cigarettes. So again, different delivery system. It may be smoother. It may have a flavor involved. People don't realize that they're actually taking in as much nicotine as there might be in a pack or more of cigarettes. These are some of the more popular products that are out there on the market and how many cigarettes one of the pods is equivalent to. So you can see that um, something like a fixed pod is equivalent to about 75 cigarettes. So if somebody says that they're a pod a day user, they may be getting the equivalent of three or four packs of cigarettes. In the US, cigarettes come 20 to a pack. More recently, we've heard a lot about disposables. And when we were doing in-school presentations, the disposable brands or devices were what guidance counselors and school resource officers were, were saying that they were hearing about from kids. Um, these are pretty affordable. In some cases, they're on sale for $3.99 to $8.99 for one or two items. A lot of them have uh, flavors. Most of them have flavors. Again, they're pre-filled, they're pre-charged, they're not covered by the federal law that came out um, talking about cartridge-based e-cigarettes. The federal law does not cover disposables. These are considered a different type of device, not cartridge-based. And as you can see, some of the nicotine contents, the 6%, 5%, that's a high level of nicotine. For some people, and again, everybody is different depending how, how a substance hits the reward center of their brain and how their brain and body react. Um, sometimes for people, occasional use leads to more frequent or regular use, and potentially a person can become totally dependent upon nicotine and other substances. One of the other things that we focus on, um, again, as a lung health organization, is that your lungs are exposed to harmful chemicals, things like formaldehyde, diacetyl, acrolein. Um, again, those particles that we talked about that may or may not be in the aerosol, the particles are not easily expelled by your lungs. They tend to build up and sit in your lungs. If you think about people in different industries over time, before they used to wear face protection, People that did a lot of sanding or installing sheetrock were exposed to a lot of dust. People that did engraving before all the um, protection systems and HVAC systems in different industries, a lot of people had different forms of lung issues or lung cancers because of these particles sitting in their lungs. And now at least there are some protections out there for people in different industries but there isn't really a protection with these devices. There isn't a filter on the end. So what you inhale is going into your lungs. 
The variety of chemicals out there can be anywhere from six to 60 chemicals or compounds. Again, all the liquids can be different from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, again, we need to keep in mind that the flavors may be approved for food or candy. We're ingesting those and slowly processing and digesting them when they're in food or candy. Uh, we are not slowly digesting or processing them when we're inhaling them as a vapor. So that's one of the scary things with these products. These are some of the more common chemicals found in products across the US when tested. Not every e-liquid contains these chemicals. These are just some of the more common ones. Um, of course, nicotine. Then you have things like rubidium, which it creates the blue or purple color in fireworks. Propylene glycol is something that's added to antifreeze. Um, acetone, anybody that's done their nails or has been in a nail salon knows how strong that that smells. That sometimes is found in e-liquids. Um, ethyl benzene is a common chemical in paints and pesticides. And then formaldehyde is something else that smells very strong. If you ever did any dissect, dissections in biology classes in school, um, that's a very strong toxic smell. These are chemicals you would not normally think of heating up and inhaling. This is just a grid of some of the other chemicals different studies have shown to be in the e-cigarette aerosols. Um, chemicals in yellow have been listed as potentially harmful substances in different states. Again, not every e-liquid is the same. Another concern as the products and devices have become more prevalent and as marijuana has become legal in different states across the country, is something called marijuana wax or dabbing. Um, these are highly concentrated forms of marijuana and it's the THC, the psychoactive component in marijuana. Um, it can look like a hard substance like honey or like butter. Um, in fact, some of, the, some of the nicknames are below indicating honey or butter. Um, it's also known as butane hash oil because of the process it undergoes. Um, that's kind of a residual effect. Just like nicotine levels have increased through the use of electronic vaping systems, so have the levels of THC. Uh, the way marijuana is processed now, the THC levels are much higher than they used to be in the 80s and 90s. Back then, a 10% level was considered strong. Nowadays, we're seeing levels of 40 to 80% in strength of THC. Um, and again, you're inhaling an aerosol product. So the way it hits your brain is much different, and you're also potentially inhaling other chemicals at the same time. Possible side effects, of course, um, from using these products and we also need to remind young people that even though marijuana is legal in some states, it is still not legal here in New Hampshire. It's been decriminalized up to a certain amount, but it's not legalized totally. We also, you have to keep in mind where you're getting it from. A lot of times it's second and third parties selling it, so we're never sure. Um, and in general, marijuana can cause impaired judgment, poor concentration, short-term memory, memory loss, um, similar to alcohol, you don't wanna be operating a motor vehicle if you've been using marijuana. The other concern with all of these products is our lungs. Um, the lungs are the body's filter. They are still developing into your early 20s like the brain is. Um, again, we only get one shot at keeping organs in our body healthy. Um, the lungs clean out on a regular basis and try to filter out things that you breathe in on a daily basis. We're all exposed to a lot of toxins and environmental things to begin with. Uh, right now, probably people are suffering from allergies um, at a high level. Um, so your lungs are very important. It happens automatically. The breathing takes place without, without us thinking about it. Just sitting in place by the end of the day, you would have inhaled about 17,000 times without doing anything stren strenuous. So again, very important to your overall health. And if you don't breathe well, you're not gonna live well. Uh, as we've seen, all of us have probably been overloaded with coronavirus or COVID-19 information. Um, it's a new virus. We're still learning an awful lot about it. These viruses can make 
a variety of people ill or sick. Um, it looks different in different people, impacts people differently. Um, we do know that respiratory viruses as a whole can infect the lower airway leading to other issues. You may get bronchitis or pneumonia as a result of some of these viruses. Um, and the symptoms, unfortunately, with COVID-19, there's a wide range of symptoms reported from people who have had it. Um, some are mild symptoms and some cause severe illness, so it's very difficult to diagnose. Um, in some cases, the symptoms are appearing as soon as two days after exposure. In some cases, it takes a couple weeks. Um, so there's a lot of different things, and these symptoms can mimic other things. If it was the fall or the winter, a lot of people may think they have the flu, not COVID-19 or some other respiratory illness. We do know um, from what we have seen to this point that there are some people around us who are at a higher risk, older adults in particular, and then people who have different medical conditions, things like asthma, COPD, chronic lung diseases, heart disease, and diabetes. One of the other concerns overall for people of all ages is for years we've been telling kids not to share water bottles at sporting events because potentially you're passing along things like bronchitis, the flu, the, the mumps or something like that. Um, there's concern that people share devices like e-cigarettes and vape devices and they don't think about it when they pass them around. Um, so with something like COVID-19 out there, you need to remember that it's spread more easily by hand-to-mouth contact. So sharing of smoking and vaping products can spread this type of virus and other viruses. Just some of the overall things we've been seeing, just reminders to avoid close contact, to practice social distancing, washing your hands. These are all things we keep seeing every day. Um, before the outbreak of COVID-19, we saw a lot of things in the news and in studies about something called E-Valley. Um, it's e-cigarette and vaping acute lung injury. Uh, prior to COVID-19, this was being trapped across the U.S. Um, it was the result of people directly using vaping products. It was not a virus-related thing, but it caused lung damage. Um, prior to COVID-19, as of February of this year, there were over 28 hospitalized cases for people that had severe enough lung damage to be admitted to the hospital, and this was as a result of vaping. In a lot of cases, they were vaping products that contained THC or vitamin E acetate as an additive. Again, the vitamin E acetate, the THC, and the other chemicals are oil-based in nature. Um, not easily expelled by your lungs, builds up in your lungs, can irritate your lungs, um, so you're more susceptible to other things. Out of the hospitalized cases, there were 68 deaths that had occurred by February. Someone as young as 15 and somebody as old as 75 had died as a result of the um, e-cigarette related lung injury. Um, so again, it was very hard to track it because of the number of devices out there and because some people were adding other substances to their e-liquid or to their device. I don't seem to be able, here we go, sorry, slide advance was delayed. Um, so again, when you look at the symptoms for the associated e-cigarette use or vaping-related lung injury, when you notice what they are, the symptoms, shortness of breath, chest pain, nausea, vomiting, those were mimicking flu symptoms when this first came out last summer and into the fall. So again, potentially people were misdiagnosed and were sent home where they continued to possibly vape or use e-cigarettes, and at some point they developed worse symptoms. There was one unique and extreme case. Um, a young man in Michigan had to have a double lung transplant as the result of vaping-related lung injury. Um, he was 17 when he had this done. 
that is an extreme case. It's not common to have a double lung transplant. It's not common at all for it to happen in a person as young as 17. Um, he had only been vaping for a few months. So this is when we say we do know some of the short-term outcomes for health of vaping, but we don't know the long-term health outcomes. The image on the left is his lungs prior to having a lung transplant. So you can't really see the lobes fully developed of his lungs. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see the outline of his lungs. Um, dramatically changed his life. He was looking at going into the military when he graduated from high school. Because of all he's gone through, that is not an option at this point. And he was restricted even before COVID-19 outbreak. He was restricted to being at home and not traveling just because his immune system was so low from the lung transplant. So we, people ask, why are these things appealing to young people? What, what's the deal? And why do kids pick up some of these products? Well, this is some samples of packaging that's used for some of the different e-liquids. The red square indicates it's an e-liquid and then the opposite on the right-hand side of the box indicates a product that's a food-related item. So you can see things look like Nella wafers or cookies. There's an e-liquid out there that looks like Lifesavers, but it's not. Um, unfortunately, the one on the bottom lower left is kind of scary because there's a, an e-juice out there that's called apple juice that looks a lot like juicy juice boxes that young kids would drink out of. So you can see where a young child might pick up something that is totally not a food item when you see some of this packaging. We think from a public health perspective that one of the issues and concerns is the flavors. If you took the flavors away from these products and people were inhaling the harshness of the chemicals and nicotine, a lot fewer people would probably continue using these products and you may not even have kids trying them as much. So flavors have a big impact on who uses them and tries these products. E-cigarette ads, um, we've seen over the years, there's actually was a back to school campaign two years ago. Um, obviously, it's not really targeting adults trying to quit smoking if you have a back to school campaign ad of ads. Um, colorful ads focused on the flavors involved in the products, the socialization, promoting it as a social thing to do when you hang out with friends. Again, a lot of young models, a lot of the social influencers for these products are very young and dynamic people on social media. Years ago, cigarette companies did something similar um, where they had cartoon characters or well-known actors and actresses who were promoting products for them. And again, this was before we had the full picture for the potential harm of cigarette smoking. The ad on the left is a cool cigarette ad from the 1990s, and the ad on the right is a jewel ad from 2016. So very similar imagery. Basically, you're just changing what the person is holding in their hand. Overall, the flavors, the ads, lack of regulation in some cases, lack of enforcement, um, it just leads to a bad combination of thing. And then when you introduce flavors, you can see why in some cases, youth use of e-cigarette product has climbed so dramatically, not just here in New Hampshire, but across the country. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has an awareness campaign of their own, trying to remind people of all ages that most e-cigarettes do contain nicotine, which can cause addiction, that it may harm your brain development, and could lead to continued use of tobacco products among youth, especially, because you're introducing an addictive substance while your brain is still developing. You are more susceptible to continue using it and to keep trying other products as you get older. So evidence so far suggests that teens who do vape or try these products, the electronic products or the battery powered products at a young age are three to four times more likely to try smoking cigarettes. And again, it's that introduction of nicotine at a young age. Um, if you talk to a lot of kids, high school, middle school kids, they'll say they never wanna smoke. They don't like the smell. They don't like how it smells on their clothing or in the car but they don't realize necessarily that the same nicotine is in some of these other products. 
And we know from years of cigarette studies that 88% of adults who started smoking started before the age of 18. Again, you have your brain still developing at that point. Uh, you've probably heard as of December of this past year, at the federal level, we passed legislation for it to be illegal to sell to kids or people under the age of 21 any tobacco product. Um, here in New Hampshire, there is a little bit of issue with legislation. We need our state law to also be passed to make enforcement able to be full picture. Right now, there is difficulty for local law enforcement to enforce the federal age, even though it was passed at the federal level. So if we can pass tobacco 21, age of sales of 21 as a state, it just ties everything together and reinforces the federal legislation. We do have policies in place for public school grounds. No tobacco products should be on public school grounds. It includes vapes, e-liquids, devices, and empty cartridges. Um, that's part of the drug and alcohol free school zones. That's a policy that's been in place for a while. Um, as parents, educators, healthcare providers, um, we try to give people you know, resources to use, talk to them, share examples, share information. Uh, things to keep in mind for young people is the potential for these products to lead to addiction, changes in your brain, that a lot of the products are unregulated. We don't know what's in all of them. They're not necessarily clearly labeled. The long-term health impacts and effects are still unknown, especially for people of a young age. Uh, we have had 50 years of studies of cigarettes. We haven't had 50 years of study of vape devices and e-cigarettes to know how it's going to turn out for people who start using the products when they're 13, 14, or 15. So we all need to just understand some of the potential risks. Keeping in mind that these products were initially put on the market to help adults quit smoking, there is no e-cigarette manufacturer that has been approved as a quit smoking tool in the US. None of them have gone through that application process. So that may have been how they marketed themselves, but none of them have gone through the process with the FDA to be marketed and licensed as a quit smoking tool. Here in New Hampshire, we do have a couple options for resources. The My Life, My Quit New Hampshire program is a vetted program created by National Jewish Health. It is through our Department of Health and Human Services. It is for kids under the age of 18. They would get a live person to talk with. It's free and confidential. Um, again, a resource because we're finding that kids do get addicted to the nicotine. Um, they don't realize it. Again, uh, the levels of nicotine in these products are much higher than cigarettes. Other resources that are out there, this is Quitting Through the Truth Initiative. Um, that's another resource that can be offered to young people and adolescents. So some of the key points, nicotine is addictive. It's not just water vapor that is coming out of these products. Um, marketed as a safe product, it, we don't know if it's safe. We can't say it's safe. We can say potentially less harmful. We can't say it's safer than cigarettes right now because we don't have long-term studies. Um, that's going to take years to develop. Uh, the impact to developing lungs and brains is kind of scary. And again, keeping in mind that part of your body develops until you're in your early to mid-20s. So that's the end of our remote presentation. Appreciate the invitation from Conway Public Library and uh, the folks that joined us today.